guest presents a painting by Zelda Fitzgerald, created while she was a patient in John Hopkins Hospital in the 1930s, intended for her psychiatrist. She was a Southern Belle who married F. Scott Fitzgerald, an acclaimed artist. They were known as the golden couple of the Jazz Age and were acquainted with numerous influential figures. Zelda encountered modernist painters in Europe, which influenced her artistic style. Her life took a tragic turn as she battled mental illness and spent time in various mental institutions. Painting became a part of her therapy, and she honed her skills in the craft. The presented painting is an oil on canvas, likely framed from that era, and in good condition. Featuring nastriums, it is convincing as Zelda's work. About this picture because you brought us some very compelling documentary evidence. The appraiser gives the auction and insurance values respectively. Between $10,000 and $15,000. To insure it, you should be thinking about perhaps $20,000. Well, that's very nice, thank you. Updated value of Zelda's beautiful painting is $25,000 to $50,000. This stunning painting by Eugene Fromentin, a renowned 19th century French Orientalist artist, has a rich history within the guest's family, passing down from their husband's grandmother to his mother, and now to them. Fromentin's work often depicted scenes from Algeria, which were highly sought after in France during the late 19th century. This painting exemplifies his signature style and captures the essence of Algerian life and culture. The appraiser values this Eugene Fromentin painting between... Between twenty-five and $35,000. Wow. Wow, okay. <laughs> Today on the show, we have something special from the past. The New York Militia Uniform, a symbol of bravery and dedication, Inherited by the guest from a family member, the uniform has the same style as military uniforms from the mid-1800s. Its material looks like wool, which was often used for uniforms back then, and the uniform's buttons are special. They have the New York Militia emblem on them, showing that the person wearing them is part of the state's military group. These are New York State buttons. They have the New York State crest. The buttons seem to be brass with a shiny finish. This uniform is a great example of military clothing from the mid-1800s. Because the uniform is in great shape and has historical importance, it would be a valuable piece in any Civil War collection, and at retail level would be auctioned at... I would say five to $7,000. Oh, wow. Okay. This stunning Tiffany lamp, purchased by the guest's mother in the late 1960s, holds a remarkable history. Initially spotted in a neighborhood newspaper flyer, the lamp was being sold by a woman who knew its value as it had belonged to her grandfather. Priced at $125, the lamp was quickly acquired by the guest's mother. 25, so my mother woo, went to the bank real quick, purchased it, and has had it ever since. Throughout the years, the lamp was hidden away in the house to protect it from the guest's playful nature. Made by the renowned Tiffany Studios, owned by Louis Comfort Tiffany, this lamp dates back to 1905. This lamp features a rose helmet shade resting on an Art Nouveau style arc and leaf base. The base, with its stylized leaf forms, is a rare find, enhancing the lamp's value and beauty. Despite doubts from dealers about its authenticity, the lamp's etched doire finish proves its genuine Tiffany origin. At auction, this Tiffany lamp could fetch between uh, this lamp is worth between $80,000 and $125,000. Congratulations. Oh. Oh, I have to give you guys a hug. This chair, acquired by the guest for $38 at a thrift store, is a remarkable find. Made of beech wood, it features traces of grain painting meant to mimic the appearance of more expensive woods like rosewood. Dating back to the early 19th century, this chair showcases intricate carving, particularly on the crest and bellflower, reflecting the influence of classical antiquity and design during that period. It's likely that this chair was made in some quantity, with journeyman craftsmen contributing to its production. The presence of a stamp on the chair indicates it was crafted by one of these journeymen. Despite its humble origins, at auction, this chair could fetch between... A thousand dollars and fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. Congratulations and uh, happy thrifting. Thank you so much. Passed down from the guest's parents, this elegant table is believed to be a pre-Civil War mixing table rather than a meat-serving table. 
classical mixing table, and these tables uh, were made in the early 19th century, so this table dates from about 1820. It was acquired by the guest's parents at an estate sale in St. Louis for $750 in 1982. Mixing tables like this were designed with marble tops to prevent damage from spilled alcohol. Although the original marble top is missing, the table's classical form and design suggest it was likely made in Boston. They did a lot of this kind of form in Philadelphia, but when we look at the secondary wood, we see that it's white pine. If it were yellow pine, it would have been a Philadelphia piece. The table features a drawer for storing mixing accoutrements and a lockable door for securing valuables, reflecting the need for security in the early 19th century. The facade is adorned with mahogany veneer, showcasing exquisite craftsmanship and luxurious materials. Despite the missing original marble top, this table is a rare and valuable piece of furniture. At auction, this mixing table could fetch between a value of... I would say an auction estimate is probably in the two to $3,000 range. Two to $3,000 range? Yes. Wow. Yes, yes. Acquired at a plantation auction near Natchez in the late 1990s, this Victorian Rococo sofa captivated the guest and her husband with its elegant crest and intricate design. Despite being unsure of the maker, they couldn't resist its allure and brought it home. Dating back to the mid-19th century, likely pre-Civil War, this sofa showcases New York craftsmanship, characterized by its distinctive C and S scrolls, and... And then we'll find these S scrolls throughout, as well as the uh, naturalistic carving that you'll see flowing along this pierce-carved crest. The unique lamination technique, similar to modern plywood, allowed for the sofa's intricate design and durability. Historically attributed to J and J.W. Meeks, based on a similar sofa given as a wedding gift, recent discoveries suggest Meeks was likely a furniture dealer representing other manufacturers. The sofa is part of a parlor set that includes various pieces, with etagés labeled as Thomas Brooks. A gentleman by the name of Thomas Brooks, okay. who was a Brooklyn cabinet maker. While the guest paid $3,000 for the sofa, its current auction value is estimated to be between... That's about the price range we'd put it at auction, okay. 2000 to 4000 Okay. All right. A cherished heirloom from the guest's great-aunt and uncle on their mother's side is not just a quilt, but a historical tapestry dating back to the opulent era of the 1890s. Each fabric piece in this quilt tells a story, with some dating as far back as the 1860s. The quilt is a treasure trove of American history, featuring elements like a ribbon, commemorating President Harrison's term, and hand-painted motifs such as... This piece right here, actually the rosebud, the roses, and the forget-me-nots are all hand-painted. The quilt's intricate embroidery and stitching showcase the artistry and craftsmanship of its time, with every block telling a unique tale through its design and embellishments. While the average price for a crazy quilt is $400 to $600, this quilt stands out as a remarkable piece, not only for its beauty, but also for its historical significance and... Well, the condition of it is almost flawless. I did not see any type of rips or tears in the silk. There is no deterioration. Its current condition and historical importance warrant a higher insurance value of... Put a $5,000 value on insurance purposes. Really? Yes. <gasps> oh my gosh. A luminous depiction of Greenwood Lake's tranquil beauty is what this piece entails. It belonged to the guest's brother-in-law who bought it the piece from the artist himself. This piece was painted by the American architect and artist Jasper F. Cropsey, who traveled extensively in Europe and the U.S., painting in various locations, yet Greenwood Lake was one of his favorite spots. Signed and dated in the center as Jasper F. Cropsey, 1881, this painting is highly desirable. His work is generally better in the late period rather than the early period. Cropsey is more desirable in his earlier period. The painting features a moody sky with gray tones contrasting with vibrant lime greens and oranges. Also, it included a figure, a boat, and a cluster of cows, elements often found in Cropsey's paintings. The frame is in excellent condition and appears to be original. However, the painting itself shows some signs of age, such as adhesive residue on the back from being mounted on masonite, yet could still command a hefty price of... If this painting were 
offered in a gallery in New York, the selling price would probably be $300,000. Oh my heavens! It's um, amazing. <laughs> One morning, our guest stumbled upon a free signboard and snagged this lamp without spending a dime. It's pretty ugly, but I can give it to somebody, but it's a lamp, so I'll just take it. Turns out it's a Louis Comfort Tiffany lamp dating back to the 1920s. The base boasts gilded bronze with an intricate enamel design, while the shade features exquisite damascene blown glass. Its stunning caramel color adds to its considerable value. The lamp bears the mark LCT Fevril, signifying it as a handmade creation by Tiffany. And okay. please don't ever transport it in one, in one piece with the shade on like you did, because the bulk of the value is in this shade. Lamp's charm lies in its history and craftsmanship. Shade can be detached, revealing its intricate details. In a retail venue, something like this could sell for between ten and $15,000. Oh my God. This dazzling 20th century ensemble exudes vintage glamour and charm. It features a beaded flapper dress, purse, and ostrich boa. They belong to the guest's great-grandmother. The dress is made of silk chiffon, intricately beaded with silver and white beads, and adorned with rhinestones that would catch the light as she danced the Charleston, a popular dance at the time. Also, the matching purse is orange and black, which is intricately beaded. And she had an orange and black beaded bag to go with her ensemble. Interestingly, the ensemble was completed with an original ostrich feather boa, a fashionable accessory of the era. Ostrich feather boas are rare to find in good condition due to feather deterioration, making the boa's excellent condition remarkable. Clearly, this piece is a testament to the style and unique taste of the early 20th century that has a combined value of the purse would sell from 125 to 150, and the boa, in the wonderful condition it's in, would sell for 150. An antique Chinese jade collection was showcased by the guest, which belonged to his late father. The collection, dating back to the 1960s, included a pebble, a bangle, and a pair of Chinese lovebirds. They discussed the historical significance of jade and its believed curative properties. The appraiser described the pebble in the collection, highlighting its pleasing tactile sensation when held. The other item, a bangle, depicted a black-brown color scheme. Additionally, it had traditional motifs carved on it, commonly found during the Ming Dynasty. Talking about the Chinese lovebirds, they depicted delicate design and clever engineering of a swinging perch. These links uh, were originally part of the whole piece of jade, um, but the, the carver has had to hollow out each link individually without breaking it. This is the amazing thing. The guest thanked for the suggested value, but mentioned the pieces were not for sale. I think the pebble bird sits so beautifully, is probably between five and 8,000. The bangle, probably about the same. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's probably in the region of uh, 20 to 40,000. Wow. This piece was given to the guest when she was a kid by her babysitter. It's a musical instrument called a ukulele, popular in the USA in the 1920s. The name comes from the ukulele and the violin. One challenge of playing this instrument is its tricky tuning. That difficult time of playing this is part of the story of this instrument. And it was made by the international music company based in Hoboken and Jersey City both of which are in New Jersey. Made by the International Music Company, based in two places, uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, and Jersey City. It's quite unique for being a mix of a bowed string and a zither, which gives it a special sound. Also, it's small and easy to carry, great for traveling and performing anywhere. With its versatility, which means one can try different playing styles and music with it, an item like this of great merchandising history in America, valued today, would go for... $50 at best, so a little bit better than the $35 it might have cost day one. These Celadon bowls have a fascinating story. They were purchased by the guest's father during the Korean War in 1953. These are indeed 800 years old, dating back to the Goryeo dynasty. Celadon is a significant part of Korean history and culture, 
influenced by Chinese celadons. These date from the Goryeo dynasty, which was 918 to 1392. Uh, in fact, the word Korea comes from Goryeo. One bowl is from the 12th century and showcases stunning floral decoration. Unfortunately, the other two bowls are not in great condition. They feature a unique technique called slip inlay decoration. These are the genuine article and they're beautiful. These are wonderful artifacts from Korean history. Despite their flaws, they are genuine artifacts of Korean history. Guest's dad bought them for $35. Despite the damage, the bowls could still fetch a good price at auction. I believe that the pair of bowls with one of them being damaged would have modest value at auction, maybe $2,000 or so. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I think in today's market, a conservative auction estimate for this Celadon bowl would be fifteen to $20,000 at auction. No. Oh my gosh, my dad would be flabbergasted. <laughs> Combined value of these three bowls is $17,000 to $22,000. What we have here are two exquisite Art Deco lapel watches with emeralds and diamonds. These pieces belong to the guest's father who owned a jewelry store. I can't remember exactly when he retired. I worked in it until I was married. And the things that he wanted, we kept. And the rest of them, sold them at an auction. The first piece is an 18 karat yellow gold lapel watch in the shape of a turtle. It features intricate chasing, giving the appearance of real texture and detail. Interestingly, the turtle is adorned with diamonds and Madeira topaz, cut and fitted together like a puzzle. Also, the watch is revealed by pushing a button on the front, causing the turtle to open up. The second piece is a stunning Art Deco lapel watch featuring a large carved emerald, accented by diamonds, black onyx, and enamel. Besides that, this piece hangs from a Hastings cord and is made of platinum, with additional accents of old mine diamonds. And you also have it accented by old mine diamonds. Now what I'm going to do is spin it around for everybody. And we can see that it's a watch. A piece such as this embodies the timeless elegance of stunning vintage jewelry treasures that are estimated to be worth. So it could be possibly $50,000 to $75,000. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Marvel at the beautiful print that encapsulates the essence of the 1960s, blending celebrity culture with the profound impact of historical events. Our guest presented this print on the show, which she acquired as a gift from her husband's cousin. This item was created by Andy Warhol, an American visual artist, film director, and producer, who was a leading figure in the pop art movement. This particular print is titled Jackie the Second, depicting the figurine of Jacqueline Kennedy. She was an American writer, book editor, and socialite who served as the First Lady of the United States from 1961 to 1963 as the wife of President John F. Kennedy. It's worth noting that this item was made in 1966 and is an artist proof, a black screen print on a lavender background. Furthermore, on the back of this print, we can see Andy Warhol's signature and the notation AP, meaning artist proof. Warhol's prints are highly desirable and one featuring Jacqueline would be even more coveted. At auction, this would undoubtedly place its value to be around... The replacement value on this print we would expect to be around $20,000. Yeah, I didn't... That, I, I was thinking more like two. <laughs> this magnificent tankard was inherited by the guest and he had known it his entire life but lacked knowledge about its origins. The tankard's form is European, likely inspired by 17th century English tankards. However, the decoration revealed a surprising twist. It was Chinese. The intricate details, featuring animals and flower heads highlighted with gold, parcel gilding, are exceptional. The only mark on the tankard, a V on the base, offered a clue to its history. This Dutch verification mark, applied in the 19th century, suggested the tankard might have come through Batavia a Dutch trader center in Asia. The booming market for Chinese art further amplified the tankard's significance. Being very rare, the estimated worth of the tankard is between... I would think we're looking at between 20 and 25,000 pounds. <laughs> My word. That's fantastic. The guest brought in a large spoon, a family heirloom passed down through generations. There was debate within the family about whether it was made of wood, but in actuality, it is a ladle made of horn. 
specifically from a Rocky Mountain sheep. The Rocky Mountain sheep horns were heated and shaped to create the ladle's form, taking advantage of the animal's natural spiral horns. The size of the ladle indicated it came from a bighorn sheep, a large animal. Ladles like this one were traditionally crafted by Native American tribes in the northern plains, including the Nez Perce, Yakima, Crow, and Blackfeet. Given the presence of the Rocky Mountains sticker and the guest's grandfather's military background, the ladle is estimated to be from the 1850s. The spoon's significance extends beyond its family heirloom status. It held cultural value as a Native American artifact and historical value as a piece from a specific era in the exploration of the West. Considering its rarity, large size, and good condition, the estimated auction value of the item is... At an auction, easily $4,000 to $6,000. Really? And, and this is without a doubt. Here we have a valuable 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers baseball signed by numerous players, including Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, and Carl Erkskeen. This baseball commemorated the Brooklyn Dodgers' only World Series win and was a gift from the guest's father's close friend, Baseball Hall of Famer Mel Ott. Authentication of baseballs is crucial, and in this case, the guest's story about receiving the ball directly from Mel Ott, along with the postcard as verification, provided the highest level of provenance possible. Furthermore, the presence of specific signatures on the ball bolstered its authenticity. For instance, Frank Kellert's signature confirmed the year as 1955, and the signatures of Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, and Carl Erkskeen on separate panels indicate that they were not inscribed by a ball boy. The inclusion of these legendary players, along with Hall of Famers like Pee Wee Reese and Gil Hodges, and a rising star like Sandy Koufax in his rookie year, added value to it. Considering the exceptional provenance, the presence of prominent signatures, and the historical significance of the 1955 World Series win, the baseball is valued at... Is minimum four to six thousand, and it really could be the sky's the limit because of the perfect provenance you have for everything here. That's great. The guest brought in a fascinating piece of furniture, a traveling desk with a bookcase top. Based on the guest's family history and a letter the guest possessed, it is believed that the desk belonged to a sea captain who acquired it in China around 1805 to 1807. The desk's design supported this theory. The top bookcase section could be detached, transforming the piece into a more compact desk suitable for ship travel. Even the presence of bale handles on the side reinforced its functionality as movable furniture. Another indicator of the desk's Chinese origin was the presence of a Chinese character identifying a drawer, a detail only a seasoned appraiser might recognize. The desk also included a practical pull-out till with compartments for writing supplies. Considering the desk's rarity, its interesting history, and its well-preserved condition, the estimated value is... It would be between twenty dollars and $25,000. This news was undoubtedly delightful for the guest. However, a recent appraisal got the price up to $25,000 to $35,000. That's, that's nice. <laughs> for a family well, piece. <laughs> well, it is a wonderful piece of furniture, and it's got an interesting history. The guest brought in a treasure trove of memorabilia that belonged to their great-great-uncle, Leslie Nunemaker, a baseball player who left his mark on several teams during his career. There were baseball magazines featuring articles about Nunemaker, showing his achievements and solidifying his status as a well-known player. A bat, possibly used by Nunemaker himself, hinted at the physical aspect of the game and the equipment choices players made. A particular highlight was the ticket stub from the 1915 World Series, a tangible connection to a historic baseball event. Even the slightly ripped edge, where the ticket was presumably torn from a booklet, added a touch of authenticity and character. The lifetime baseball silver pass spoke volumes about Nunemaker's dedication to the sport. It likely granted him access to games throughout his career, a cherished privilege for any baseball enthusiast. The cufflinks, some engraved with dates and others depicting baseballs, served as subtle yet stylish tributes to Nunemaker's profession. However, the crown jewel of the collection was undoubtedly the 1912 Boston Red Sox Championship Medal. This wasn't just any medal, it was awarded directly to Nunemaker, a personalized recognition of his contribution to the team's victory. Taking everything into account, the estimated value of the entire collection is worth 
I would insure this for no less than $25,000. <laughs> Presented on the show is a meticulously crafted vintage toy limousine. This toy limousine belongs to the guest's husband, who is a plumber. Sometimes, when people can't pay him, they give him things, and this toy limousine is one of those items. The toy limousine was made by a company called George Carette, a German company. Produced in the early 1900s when automobiles were very expensive, parents often bought these toys for their children. There are some intriguing details worthy of note on this item such as the beveled glass that surrounds the toy. Details, you'll notice all the way around the glass is all beveled glass. It's all complete, which is pretty amazing to put beveled glass in a toy. Additionally, noticeably is a little driver figure in the limousine's driver's seat. Furthermore, all the original headlamps and side lamps are present, which are often missing in items like this. All the doors are also still in pristine condition, evident by how easily they open and close. However, the tires are a bit damaged. The timeless charm of this piece lingers, and it is in fairly good condition. It is expected to fetch an auction value of around... In the five to six thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> this is a mid-20th century Papua New Guinea slit drum, echoing ancient rhythms. The guest bought it from a shop in Evanston, North Carolina, which was run by Northwestern University. Quite remarkably, this piece originates from the Ramu River area of Papua New Guinea. And this right here, the way that this head is carved, uh -huh. that's diagnostic for Ramu River. Made from wood, this piece has metal cutting evident on sharp edges, a technique that became more common in the mid-20th century. It features a distinctive red pigment typical of the region's craftsmanship. Also, the intricate carvings represent cultural or spiritual motifs significant to the Ramu River area. Furthermore, there are signs of wear and age, including a large gap and crack in the wood, impacting its value. However, taking into account its authenticity, age, and current market for this piece of cultural heritage, it is valued at... So, this thing now is probably worth three to five thousand. If you had one that was, say, into the 19th century and it was done with shell or stone, it could be fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand yeah. dollars This item is a relic of the rugged frontier, a pipe tomahawk once wielded by intrepid frontiersmen. Today's guest inherited this piece from his grandmother. This pipe tomahawk was made for a man who would venture into the frontier with a rifle, likely a soldier. Furthermore, this item was crafted by a gunsmith in Pennsylvania or Virginia circa 1780 to 1790. An early Federal Eagle emblem is visible on its handle. Also visible is a silver medallion engraved with GW, likely referring to George Washington. George Washington was an American founding father, military officer, and politician who served as the first president of the United States from 1789 to 1797. A tomahawk like this is exceedingly rare and is considered a national treasure, crafted from curly maple. It's not often that an item of such significance to American history is presented on the show. Additionally, it is remarkably well-preserved and would fetch a whopping auction value of... I would ask $150,000. Wow, I'm stunned. <laughs> well... The guest presented a remarkable album of autographed letters and documents from the Revolutionary War told me it was from the collection of your grandmother? Yeah, my, well, both grandparents, but I think my grandmother was the big collector. The album contained letters with exquisite handwriting from several generals, offering insights into their activities during the war. The first document, though not in Washington's hand, bore his signature and discussed troop passes and paper shortages. Another notable letter was from Benedict Arnold, addressing stolen supplies. Additionally, there was a letter signed by Henry Knox, who later became Washington's Secretary of War. The album was elegantly bound with George Washington's family arms on the cover, crafted by the English firm Riviere. Inside, there was a miniature painting of Washington. With the historical significance of the letters potentially driving the price even higher, the appraiser estimated it would fetch... I would certainly not hesitate to estimate it at at least forty to $60,000. Today's episode features a conoid bench and drawing, which was bought by our guest's parents. It was made by a man known as the father of the American craft movement, George Katsutoshi Nakashima, who was a Japanese-American woodworker, architect, and furniture maker. 
One interesting fact about the bench is that it was handmade, unlike others produced in factories during that time, and exhibiting a blend of American and Japanese styles with a textured knot and a top resembling a tori arch from Japan. The top of this bench looks to me like a tori arch from Japan coming into a Shinto temple. This bench is a take on an 18th century Windsor bench brought into a 20th century one, crafted from walnut and hickory styles. The demand for Nakashima furniture has skyrocketed, especially with the original drawing included. This would make it highly valuable and auctioned at. Benches like this at auction are selling for $40,000. Oh Today, gracing our show is an exquisite piece of art crafted by a self-taught artisan. Lee Godi. She celebrated as Chicago's most revered artist, captivating many with her oeuvre. The art was bought by our guest himself. This is an enigmatic and unconventional masterpiece. It was probably a self-portrait and epitomizes her distinctive methodology and artistic expression. With its simplistic forms, daring contours, and the vibrant palette bearing testament to her ingenuity. The art is rendered with childlike simplicity, just like most of Lee Godi's work. What value can we put on a painting embodying such a singular artistic style, unconventional lifestyle, and enigmatic persona? Here, a retail value of $30, but she gave to me for $25. So she really liked it. Yeah, she liked it. When you talk about baseball legends, Bill Wompkins, who was an American second baseman in Major League Baseball, makes the list. And after he retired in the 40s, he went and uh, managed girls' professional baseball. This archive commemorates Wompkins' historical baseball career and legacy coaching women's professional baseball. Looking at the archive, you could see photos from the Fort Wayne Daisies and Muskegon Lassies, along with a trophy from the Lassies' championship victory. What we're looking at here, I think, is really super because up until not that long ago, women's baseball was not treated in the same fashion as men's professional baseball. Wompkins is remembered for his unassisted triple play in the 1920 World Series and his contribution to women's baseball during his career. Surely, this archive is a testament to his impact on both men's and women's baseball, showcasing a pivotal era in sports history with an estimated value of... ...to place an insurance value on the whole group as an archive somewhere between eight and $10,000 for insurance purposes. Guest brought letters of Israel Putnam from the Revolutionary War, inherited from his grandmother. This collection is important because Israel Putnam was a famous Revolutionary War general. He's a famous Revolutionary War general. He was an important figure at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He is credited with having said, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. The letters include business dealings predating the Revolutionary War and a crucial war date letter from 1777. These are sort of businessy letters. One is about buying a horse, the other is about a land tra transaction. This important letter is addressed to John Hancock, president of the Continental Congress, in which Putnam mentions preparations for the battle against Clinton at Fort Montgomery. There's also a letter from Putnam's son. The mezzotint portrait provides a contemporary glimpse of Putnam. Revolutionary War items are highly sought after by collectors. Value of each pre-war letter is... I would put the value of the pre-war letters each at $2,000 to $3,000 a piece. One letter from his son has value. The one from the son is, because he's a lesser figure, will be in the $800 to $1,200 range. Putnam's portrait value is? The Putnam portrait is $1,000 to $1,500. Value of important war letter is? I would value at $12,000 to $18,000. No way. Wow. Crazy. The whole collection has been valued between $17,000 to $26,000. The guest's wife, on a quest to find a specific birthday gift, spotted this curious picture amidst the coins and other trinkets. This incredible artwork is a limited edition print by David Hockney, arguably the most celebrated living English artist. Making lithographs, etchings, screen prints, both in, in Europe and in the United States. Renowned for his work across various printmaking techniques, Hockney gained particular recognition for his innovative approach in the 1980s. This piece, titled Celia with Chair, exemplifies his handmade photocopy prints. This unique print features a woman, Celia, a frequent muse of Hockney's, depicted in a musical style reminiscent of Picasso's influence. 
The signed and dated piece is numbered, indicating it's part of a limited edition. The appraiser estimates the value of this pawn shop to be... I would put an estimate of $7,000 to $10,000 on Oh this. my gosh. So That's wonderful. The guest brought in a pair of bronze and iron ornaments from the 1880s. His in-laws bought a house in Newport, Rhode Island in the 1950s that was built in 1881. Their style was identified as Victorian art, which was known for its monumental size and revival styles, not designed to hold burning logs, but rather to be ornaments for the front of the fireplace. These were originally a pair, and that a chain would have swaggered between them to protect them from fire. The andirons are made of bronze and have traces of silver plating along the top. It's bronze. Along the top here you can see traces of silver plating. They feature a mix of different elements, including a hippocampus tail, harpy claws and wings, and a serpent-like dragon neck. The most interesting detail is the face, which looks like a Scotty dog or another terrier. The appraiser estimates that the fair auction value of these andirons would be... I think a fair auction estimate would be $5,000 to $7,000. Very nice. Yeah, very, it's a very nice example. Here we have a remarkable piece of American history. A Philadelphia high boy passed down to the owner's family for an astounding 200 years. Crafted in the quintessential Queen Anne style around 1766, it embodies the elegance of a bygone era. Originally intended as a treasured dowry gift, the high boy boasts classic black walnut on its doorfronts, a hallmark of Philadelphia high boy design. Graceful Marlboro, a signature feature of the style, extended from the lower section, adding a touch of sophistication. And then his heart pierced skirt is shaped uh, really perfectly and sort of runs into these cabriole legs with angular knees, which you see in Philadelphia uh -huh. this period. A peek inside reveals the use of yellow pine, a common material choice for Philadelphia furniture makers. This heirloom holds immense sentimental value for the owner, but its worth extends far beyond family history. Ten years ago, the owner's father had the high boy appraised, receiving a promising estimate of $25,000. Given its rarity and exceptional condition, experts would fetch a staggering sum at auction. And I would put forty to sixty thousand dollars on it. Wow, well, it's really a—it's a, it's a yeah. great, great uh -huh. high boy. This piece showcased a cherished limited edition celebration of Harlem's vibrant culture. More than just a book, this piece is a time capsule of artistic brilliance and historical significance. This particular copy, passed down through generations, holds a unique story of wartime friendships and treasured connections. So my mother had it in her possession since World War II. And my mother did tell me that Al Hirschfeld. Quite fascinating, these illustrations, brought to life by the renowned caricaturist Al Hirschfeld, capture the spirit and energy of Harlem in the 1940s. Each lithograph is a testament to Hirschfeld's talent for celebrating life's nuance with wit and charm, while also honoring the vibrant culture of Harlem. When people think of the book, it's the illustrations. It was limited to a thousand copies. The book's rarity, coupled with its pristine condition and the inclusion of the original slipcase, adds an extra layer of value and historical charm that's valued at... I was going to say probably $3,500 to $4,000. Oh, my. Uh, but with the slipcase, I'd say maybe closer to $5,000. Oh that slipcase is rare. This exquisite painting, passed down from the owner's mother, holds a special place in their heart. The remarkable artwork depicts a majestic figure, a robed Lohan, deeply engrossed in religious texts. He sits regally on a bamboo stool, adorned in luxurious fabrics with golden accents. What's really interesting about this picture is the dramatic size of the individual, the scope, the scale of the image. An archaic bronze censer and an incense box rest beside him hinting at his spiritual practices. The background, filled with calming bamboo imagery, creates a serene atmosphere. While the exact artist remains unknown, the appraiser pinpoints the era based on stylistic clues. The lavish clothing, the use of archaic vessels, and the overall composition all suggest the early Ming Dynasty, placing its creation sometime in the 14th or 15th century. Intriguingly, the painting's condition reveals its age. This unsigned masterpiece, with its exceptional quality and historical significance, is a true gem.
The estimated auction value would be in the range of... I would, I would actually say closer to $40,000 to $60,000. Wow. This necklace has a sentimental history. It was a gift from the owner's grandfather to her grandmother. And when she graduated college, they passed it down to her. It's from the Etruscan Revival period, drawing inspiration from ancient styles. The necklace showcases a stylized amphora shape adorned with fluted beads on a foxtail chain. It's crafted from high carat gold, possibly 18 to 20 carats in purity. This style experienced popularity during the 1860s and 1870s, with a probable origin in Italy. Its maker is unknown, but the craftsmanship suggests that it was a skilled artisan. Notice the tiny holes? They're for soldering and prevent bead implosion. The granulation technique adds small beads, paying homage to ancient craftsmanship. If you don't mind, I'm going to get up and put it on you. All right. <laughs> What's its value? It's, it's going to be $5,000 to $7,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This would probably cost around $10,000 to replace. Wow. Yeah. Wow. This oil painting is a captivating piece that encapsulates the essence of the Pennsylvania Impressionist style. Painted around 1940 by the renowned American painter George W. Sauter. Sauter was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but eventually made his name in Philadelphia. Passed down through generations, this piece is a cherished painting that continues to captivate and inspire. This painting was once displayed at the Phillips Mill Gallery in New Hope, outside Philadelphia, showcasing scenes of the area. Looking at this painting, it's evident that Sauter, known for his nocturnal scenes, masterfully captures the tranquility of a snowy night. But he's one significant artist out of that group who particularly did these nocturnal scenes. His skillful use of light and shadow creates a serene atmosphere, drawing the viewer into a peaceful winter landscape. Evidently, this painting not only reflects Sauter's talent, but also serves as a reminder of the rich artistic heritage of the New Hope School that is worth at least... I think it would comfortably make fifteen to $20,000. Is that, oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. very, very nice to hear.